There's a man on the internet who has an incredible memory. He's able to remember the names, dates, and times of specific events that occurred over 30 years ago. He even remembers the names of news anchors on channels these events broadcast on, even though he was only a child when these events happened. He's also an incredible jumper who's able to jump on any bandwagon, no matter how small it is. But unfortunately, there's a dark side to this person. He's addicted to drama. He spreads rumors about people he doesn't know with facts he doesn't have. He does this in a secret bid to silence and deplatform people he doesn't like. For the first time ever, I'm about to expose who this person is and what he's been up to in the dark underbelly of the internet. Welcome to a very special Tales from the Internet. Welcome to the best show in the universe, I'm Maddox. I'm about to tell you a story of a YouTuber named Justin Wang. For those of you who don't know, Justin is a YouTuber, self-proclaimed internet historian, and tragically, a member of a new metal band. And no, that's not just a joke, he really is a member of a new metal band. New metal, also known as not metal, is the soundtrack of being grounded for not eating your vegetables. It's all the things you like from rap, and all the things you like from metal, left on the cutting room floor so all you have left is crap. It's one of the only genres of music where the Wikipedia entry has an entire section dedicated to new metal bands who insist they're not new metal, including Linkin Park, Limp Bizkit, and Stain. In an Artist Direct interview, the vocalist for Stain said, If we get called a new metal band one more time, I don't even know what I'm gonna do. Stain's Wikipedia page calls them a new metal band. Even the bassist of Rage Against the Machine publicly apologized for Limp Bizkit, saying, I feel really bad that we inspired such bullshit. And Dave Mustaine of Megadeth said in an interview that he'd rather have his eyelids pulled out than listen to new metal. But despite the genre being dead since 2009, Justin's new metal band still inexplicably exists. The band is called Jinx, and no, that's not named after the blackface Pokemon or the children's game. Jinx, you owe me a soda. Ooh. In an interview with the lead singer of Justin's band, the inspiration for the name came from his interest in witchcraft and because he thinks that he has bad luck. Wow, that's pretty metal, I guess, because when I think of metal, I think of teenage girls casting spells on each other. You're a witch! Yes, a band composed of a bunch of guys in their 30s took the concept of a jinx pretty seriously. This was literally the plot of an episode of How I Met Your Mother. Jinx! Kids, you may be wondering why five adults in their 30s would take a jinx so seriously. Good question. They call themselves New Metal with a New York attitude and cite Limp Bizkit as one of their inspirations. At one point, Justin made a video spitting some hard truth about why your friends support more popular bands and not yours, saying something I actually agree with that you should earn your fans. Personally, when my band plays, I don't want them to come out to a show unless they're actually into the music. You gotta keep fucking working on it and not putting so much pressure on them to support you. But because Justin is a giant hypocrite, he also says things like this. Come see me on fucking tour, you fucking assholes. <laughs> You've been jinxed! Now, as much fun as it is to clown on bad music, the reason I'm mentioning it is because Justin has something else in common with shitty derivative rap rock, and that's shitty derivative YouTube channels. Justin is better known for his YouTube series called Tales from the Internet, where he chronicles famous people and events like he's some sort of historian of the internet, or internet historian, if you will. Despite the fact that other channels were already doing the same thing. But more on that later. He first launched his channel by doing a series of Let's Play videos that failed to get any traction because they were indistinguishable from the many other Let's Play videos out there, save for the fact that he occasionally drinks with his pinky out. And when people weren't interested in watching him play video games in his depressingly dark room, it's kind of boring. He resorted to the lazy comedic device that's a last resort for every hack comedian and YouTuber when they don't have a personality, getting drunk. While it can sometimes work, it only works when the underlying person or material is funny, not because of the alcohol, but usually in spite of it. But unfortunately, Justin isn't funny. His comedic shtick is comprised of one-second callbacks where he points out something he just said. Well, what it actually refers to is groping. <laughs> I like how I put my hands to the camera when I said groping. And this really bad impression of Trump, I guess. I don't even know who he's parodying. Emails, Aleppo. What the hell is Aleppo anyway? I thought this was America. We don't speak no Italian here. And to make things worse, his videos are punctuated with a lack of polish that simultaneously comes across as lazy and contemptuous of his audience. For example, he forgot to set his phone to silent while recording, got a text message, and then decided to keep these takes. And this has happened multiple times. Pootie pie, I'm not even fucking, I'm not fucking Sam Hyde, I'm fucking nobody. Oh, I forgot to turn my phone off again, but yeah, I'm just white supremacist Nazi. I guess I should have turned my fucking phone off again. I'm a fucking popular guy. You know, it's- Awesome. 
And then there is this video where he constantly cracks himself up while mispronouncing Spanish words, but he decided to include this nauseating take where he starts wheezing and coughing on camera. I've sped up some of the laughing to make it slightly less unbearable. <laughs> then after this train wreck of a video, he thought it was such a good idea that he decided to make it a regular series. I feel like this is going to be a recurring series, so if you guys have any words that you want to hear me pronounce in any fucking language that isn't English, by all means, let me know. Yeah, I've got one for you, Justin. Try aburrido. Eres aburrido. Suffice it to say that these videos didn't take off. Nothing seemed to be working on Justin's channel, so what do you do when you're not funny, not interesting, and not original enough for people to care about who you are? You talk about someone who is. So Justin jumped on the drama bandwagon. From Pro Jared to James Charles to Adam Saleh to H3H3 and PewDiePie, there isn't a bandwagon too big or too small for Justin to jump on. He even made a video series where he went after content creators and comedians for allegedly stealing jokes and memes, like he was some sort of content cop. If that sounds familiar, that's because there's already a popular web series by iDubbbz called Content Cop, which is a more nuanced, clever, and tongue-in-cheek series than Justin's shitty imitation. But that's not where the similarities end, because Justin even shamelessly called his video Meme Police. Ah yes, let's look up a synonym for the word cop and... Nobody will notice. Good job, Justin, I think it worked. Except even this seems lifted straight from iDubbbz's video, because he literally has a Content Police sketch. Oops! This is some high school level plagiarism where you just change a few words. One of his first content cop, I mean, meme police videos was about comedian Rob Schneider and how he allegedly stole a joke from a meme. If it does sound kind of familiar, it's because he stole that fucking joke from a meme that was being shared around at least three days before he tweeted that. Justin doesn't provide any evidence that he stole the joke. His only argument is that he saw a similar meme posted earlier. So he concluded that Rob Schneider must have seen the same meme that Justin saw and therefore stole the joke. How likely is it to have happened? Well, it's hard to tell because the original tweet was deleted. But since the possibility exists, that was apparently good enough for Justin to accuse Schneider of joke theft. People have this idea that just because they saw a joke inside of a picture as a caption that it's suddenly free reign for them to steal it and passes it off as their own. For him to do this hack bullshit, he needs to be called the fuck out. Justin doesn't give Schneider the benefit of doubt or consider the possibility that two people could have come up with the exact same joke independently. In fact, he feels so strongly about content theft that he's harped on about it in several videos. Content theft is fucking horseshit. There's just something about, you know, actual content theft that just triggers the fuck out of me. The point is I fucking can't stand content theft. So it came as a surprise when I saw this tweet of Justin's not too long ago. It had over 6,000 retweets and 42,000 likes. That's a legitimately viral tweet. Good job, Justin. Except Justin didn't come up with that joke. And the reason I know is because it's actually funny. This joke was written in 2014 by a guy named Jay Branscombe, and it was very popular with over 43,000 shares and 17,000 likes on Facebook alone. So if the pre-existence of a much less popular meme was enough for Justin to conclude that Rob Schneider was a joke thief, then judging by his own criteria, we have to conclude that Justin must have stolen this joke. But still, you might be thinking, well, maybe he didn't see it. Maybe we should give him the benefit of doubt, even though he didn't extend that same courtesy to Rob Schneider. So how likely was it that Justin saw this joke somewhere else before he posted it? Well, it's hard to say, but there was this article about it in the Huffington Post. Now, I know what you're thinking. Nobody reads the Huffington Post, especially not a hard rockin' new metal boy like Justin. But then there was also this article about it in USA Today. Well, sure, maybe Justin didn't see that article either. But then there was this one from Business Insider, and this one from Hollywood Reporter, and this one from The Guardian, and The LA Times, and The New York Daily News, and Fox 8, and AV Club, and E, and National Post, and WGN, and Daily Mail, and Fox 6, and BuzzFeed, and Express.co.uk, and The Hindu Times, Thought Catalog, ABC 10, The Independent, CTV News, Psychology Today. There have been over 50 articles written about this one joke alone. In fact, it was so popular that it was even covered on a number of news programs. Steven Spielberg is at the center of a viral photo controversy after an internet humorist posted this photo of the director to Facebook. So it's just surprising that someone like Justin, in all his years on the internet as an internet historian, somehow missed all these people sharing this original meme and this news program or any of the more than 50 articles. 
But what makes it especially difficult to give someone like Justin the benefit of doubt is that he's positioned himself as some kind of meme smith. Who I consider myself a bit of a meme smith. In fact, he was interviewed about the history of memes on one of the most authoritative websites when it comes to memes. And even knowyourmeme.com literally has an archive of this exact meme. Oops. When it comes to accusing others of stealing jokes, he has an encyclopedic memory of memes. But when it comes to his own joke theft, his memory gets a little foggy. It's always the most sanctimonious people who are the ones who are guilty of the thing that they claim to be so against. And what's especially egregious about Justin's hypocrisy is that he has the audacity to complain about how unfair it is when a bigger person steals a smaller person's work. The idea that, especially like when you're not that big and you're trying to grow, that someone who is much larger than you can take your fucking work and really without fucking consequence, you'll be forgotten about. This is Justin's Twitter following, and this is Jay Branscombe's. In another content cop, I mean meme police video, a video series that's totally original and not a ripoff, Justin harps on a guy named Liam Deneen for posting memes to promote himself, and he complains because he doesn't know who he is. Justin also criticized this guy for allegedly stealing content, posting granny memes, and using these memes on his Instagram page to grow his fan base. But first I go to this Instagram page, and the Instagram page is just the same fucking memes that are on his Facebook page, and he's just some dude that's become wildly popular for posting really bad fucking memes. So it came as a surprise when I looked at Justin's Instagram page and saw hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of memes that Justin has posted without credit or attribution. Now, I get it, it's sometimes very difficult, if not impossible, to track down the source of every meme you see, let alone share on the internet. I try my best, but I'm sure there's stuff I've missed. Justin, however, is the self-appointed meme police, and he keeps harping on and on about how much he hates content theft. So it comes as a surprise that he calls out so many other people while seemingly doing the exact same thing. Even Liam Deneen posts sources and credits on some of his memes, but not Justin. He rarely credits any of his memes on his Instagram account. Among the thousands he's posted, he doesn't even credit ones that are easy to find. Then he has the audacity to criticize people for posting granny memes while posting memes like this. And this. And this, which is literally a granny meme. But Justin's hypocrisy doesn't end there because he also criticizes people for posting jokes that are too similar to ones they already posted. You ever have that corny friend that like, every they'll try to make jokes all the fucking time and nobody laughs except for maybe one time a fucking year they say something actually funny, everyone laughs, and then they, they try to capitalize on it. They can't like let it die. They gotta make another version of the same fucking joke. But there are dozens of examples of him posting the same joke repeatedly on his Instagram account. Sometimes he posts the exact same one with slight variations over and over and over again. In fact, sometimes he even posts the exact same meme twice, just a few months apart. Of course, both times without credit. Well, I consider myself a bit of a meme smith. Look, I get it, memes are ubiquitous and almost everyone posts them from time to time, myself included. It's hard to track down every single meme and I'm sure I've posted a few without proper attribution, but I do my best and I post credits whenever I can. But it's a different story when you harangue other people for doing it when you're doing the exact same thing. In recent years, some big Instagram accounts have been accused of plagiarism for using memes to grow their audiences without giving credit to the creators. Justin's done the same thing. He's not just some kid sharing memes on the internet. He's amassed over 75,000 followers on Instagram alone without giving many of these creators proper credit. Now you might be thinking, but Maddox, they're just memes, so what? And you're right, it wouldn't matter so much except he's promoting his brand and merchandise alongside these memes, so he's making money using other people's content. You would think that someone who deputized himself as the meme police and is doing interviews on meme websites would hold himself to a higher standard. I wonder if he's ever said anything about people who grandstand and act morally superior while doing the exact same thing. You don't get to grandstand, act like you're morally superior to someone, meanwhile you're basically doing the same fucking thing that they did. On September 10th, 2017, Justin finally made his first relatively successful video, and it was successful because it had nothing to do with him. It was about some supposed drama between H3H3 and Sam Hyde. It was, in his own words, the most growth he'd seen on his own channel in a single month. That shit was amazing for my channel. This is probably the most growth I've ever had in a single fucking month. But the problem with drama is that once you get a taste of that sweet drama juice, it becomes addictive. You either have to keep finding drama or making it to feed the content beast. As soon as someone draws a little blood, all the rats come out and it's fucking disgusting because all these fucking people are grasping at straws. But don't take my word for it. 
Those are literally Justin's words. As soon as someone draws a little bit of blood, all the rats come out. We all need that sweet drama juice to drive our channels. I could see why the drama juice is so fucking addictive, but it's fucking disgusting. It's fucking disgusting because all these fucking people now, they're grasping at straws. You're talking about yourself. You're talking about yourself, you astounding hypocrite. He even said it again in another video in a moment of mind-numbing lack of self-awareness. Now you're starved for content, you've got a big growing fan base, and you're chasing those fucking likes, you need to feed the content beast. That's fucking sick. Now remember that clip because I'll be referencing it later. Once he exploited the drama for all it was worth, he turned his attention to Tales from the Internet, a series where he delves into popular events and people online. So another series where it's popular not because of him, but in spite of him. One of his most popular videos is about the Max Headroom incident from the 80s, where someone jammed a signal of a TV broadcast in Chicago. That much is fairly common knowledge. But what isn't common knowledge is all the detail Justin goes into. He cites specific names. Chuck Swirsky, John McDougal, Captain Midnight, dates, October of 2015, 2010, call letters, WGN TV, WTTW TV, an ad campaign, the new Coke, catch the wave, Coke, and even seemed to recognize the theme song to an old cartoon from the late 1950s. Note that the song he's singing here is the theme song from an old cartoon called Clutch Cargo. What? The only thing Justin doesn't cite are sources, at least for the first 4 minutes and 10 seconds of the video. While Justin does use news clips at the start of his video, those clips are over 30 years old. So the only way he could have known that those clips existed was if he read someone else's research. Well, you might be thinking that maybe Justin might have just known this information from memory. Except this incident occurred in 1987, and according to this website, Justin was born in 1984, which means that he was just 3 years old when it happened. So that means either Justin was able to remember all those names, dates, and times 30 years later to make a video about it, or that he's a plagiarist. Plagiarism is when you present someone else's work, ideas, or research as your own. According to Evidence Explained, this includes changing a few words, changing the sentence structure, or using synonyms, like he did with Meme Police. Most of Justin's video is full of research that he didn't come up with. Now you might be thinking that some of these are basic facts, and they are. For instance, we know that an incident occurred, but most people wouldn't be able to recognize specific details like the theme song that was hummed from an obscure cartoon from the 1950s. Someone else did that research and put all those pieces together, and it sure as shit wasn't Justin. For most of the video, Justin rattles off details about the event, giving the impression that his video is very well researched. And it is, just not by him. Since there have been dozens of articles and videos made about this over the years, it's hard to tell exactly which he used since he doesn't credit most of his sources. For example, there are sections in Justin's video that seem to lift exact quotes and in the exact same sequence as a WFLD broadcast by Jack Connedy. And this time there was audio. By this time, the pirate had managed to insert audio. Now you might be wondering, aren't these just basic facts? Wouldn't everyone report them the exact same way? No. In fact, here are four different broadcasts covering the same event, focusing on different observations, details, and phrasing, because none of them were plagiarized, unlike Justin's. Other than this newscast, most of Justin's video seems cobbled together using bits and pieces of different articles written by other people that he only credits one time despite the fact that he uses huge chunks of it for his video. For example, this article by Chris Nittel seems to be his primary source. It's a theme song from an old cartoon called Clutch Cargo. Clutch Cargo! And at one point he even used the exact same footage from a commercial that was referenced in the article. At the time of this hack, the real Max Headroom was the spokesperson for the new Coke. That's the way, Coke! <sighs> I found four different Coke commercials that Justin could have used to make his point, but he lazily didn't do his research and just used Chris's work without giving him credit. Finally, after 4 minutes and 10 seconds of Justin pilfering research from this article, he finally cites his source, but that doesn't happen until after he's already used much of it earlier in the video without credit, and even then, he only cites it for a small portion, giving the impression that everything that came before it was his original research when it wasn't. According to Vice Motherboard, the Eric Fournier theory is as follows. So you might be wondering, why does any of this matter? Well, it's because plagiarism is theft, and for a guy who supposedly hates content theft so much, he sure does seem to do a lot of it. But maybe the reason Justin doesn't cite his source is because if he did, his video would sound like this. According to Vice Motherboard, the anchor Dan Rohn had this to say. According to Vice Motherboard, the real Max Headroom was the spokesperson. According to Vice Motherboard, the song he's singing here is the theme song. The guy who wrote this article did all the hard work of tracking down interviews, trawling through archive footage, and he even filed a freedom of information request through the FBI. 
Justin then came along and skimmed off the top of his work for a shitty YouTube video where he even got some major facts wrong. At one point in his video, Justin flat out lies. 30 plus years later, he still hasn't been caught. But there are a few suspects. No, there are not. The real smoking gun in this case. There is no smoking gun in this case because there is no case. There are no leads, there are no suspects, none, period. The person who did this is still at large, end of story. For over 10 minutes in his video, Justin casually implicates innocent people of crimes with penalties of up to $100,000 and a year in prison. This includes one guy who not only had the inability to pull this off, but he wasn't even able to defend himself because he's dead. Eric himself isn't able to deny this theory as he passed away in 2010, according to Vice Motherboard. For the last seven minutes of the video, Justin reads a Reddit article where someone mistakenly thought the culprit was someone he met at a party, but it turns out he was wrong. Justin inexplicably decided to include this in his video anyway, despite the fact that the very Reddit post he's reading from has an update stating very clearly that these people are officially eliminated as suspects. But instead of omitting this bogus lead, Justin decided to keep it in and incredulously glossed over the fact that they've been cleared, almost like it's an afterthought at the end of his video. If the information they gained is true and J and K can't possibly be the suspects... Of course, saying that there are suspects makes the video sound more exciting, like there's an active case with leads, clues, and evidence, and that the culprit could be caught any day now. But unfortunately, none of that is true. This video is misleading and irresponsible. This entire 10 minute section of Justin's video could have been boiled down to this. So, uh... It turned out they weren't the guys. Don't forget to smash that like button, hit subscribe for new videos every- Since Justin didn't credit most of his sources, I tracked down as many as I could and listed them here. As for the news footage used in Justin's video, he doesn't explicitly credit the website. The watermark was added by the Museum of Classic Chicago Television, and it's the source for most of his news footage, but Justin doesn't even link to them from the video description. Fuzzy Memories is run by volunteers who tirelessly archive lost footage from old VHS tapes, and they deserve some credit for their hard work, including the footage I used in this video. Since Justin didn't link to them, I will. You can support them here. Perhaps another reason Justin didn't credit all his sources is because if he did, we'd see that most of his video isn't his content. If you isolate just the parts where Justin talks without using other people's content, it's only 2 minutes and 53 seconds of his 13 minute video of his own original content. And that's being generous because I included the time he spent plugging his channel at the end. So nearly 11 minutes of his 13 minute video are other people's content. These truly are tales from the internet. Since most of Justin's video consists of other people's content, I've decided to make a template video that anyone can use to make your very own tales from the internet videos. And yes, this is real. Just replace the parts where Justin is talking, which isn't much, and you can use the rest of his video almost verbatim because it's not his content. If he's going to use other people's content, you can too. Except I've provided sources for you to use so it's not plagiarized. Link is in the description, send me your videos and I'll shout out the best ones. And in case you're wondering, this wasn't just a shitty video I cherry picked from his library, this kind of hacky bullshit is all over his channel. For example, in another Tales from the Internet, he tries to find out who made the Italian version of an anime theme song. And of course, it's chock full of more plagiarism. For example, watch Justin's eyeline carefully around the 7 minute and 54 second mark. Raji Fotonici is an Italian band that specializes in covers of cartoon theme songs. Did you catch it? Here it is again in case you missed it. Cartoon theme songs. Cartoon theme songs. Nice edit. Hey, let's play a quick game. I want you to guess what Justin is looking down at at this point in the video. Is it A, his own original script that he wrote after doing tireless research and becoming deeply familiar with the subject matter so that he was able to paraphrase and share his own original thoughts and findings with you? Or B, some shit he plagiarized from a post he found on Reddit? If you guessed A, you are absolutely incorrect, you fucking idiot. Of course it's B. You should have guessed that based on the content in the rest of this video. Justin plagiarized from this post on Reddit almost verbatim. Raji Fotonici is an Italian band that specializes in covers of cartoon theme In 2007, they released an album called Gente di Cartoonia. The fourth track on this album was a cover of La Mou's theme song. The account for the person in the original thread was deleted, so I looked up an archive to find out it was written by a Reddit user named Risa Picerum. This person did all the hard work of not just summarizing the information from a thread in a different forum, but then translating it from Italian, not Justin. 
It took me just a few minutes of research to find this, and I couldn't care less about this Dork Lord anime bullshit. I literally did more research on this part of the video than Justin. That's research he should have done, but didn't. Instead, he plagiarized this post almost beat for beat for this entire video. Before him, Mirko had hopes that laying claim to this song would cause its true creator to come out of hiding. <laughs> Constantino's lawyer got involved and said that the song was already a part of the show in Colonia 1 in Poland. This is a Polish TV station that was founded by Italians and often runs the Italian versions of anime. <laughs> Furthermore, anime fans from Poland said that the show never aired over there. And it's not just old videos either. Here's a relatively recent sponsored video he made where he seems to lift huge chunks of it from a Medium article. So he's making money off of other people's content. I've only included a few examples, but there is a lot. In 2006, the Tobuzu completed their new penguin enclosure. Grapekun and Midori being among the penguins making the move. It's possible that this was because when he was taken away, they had believed he had died. So by now you're probably wondering, why am I going after this guy so hard? After all, I don't normally go after other YouTubers like this. My targets are usually children and animals. So why am I going after Justin? Well, it's because Justin went after me. Buckle up, because this video is about to take a very strange turn. There is another side to Justin that most people don't know about. Not that most people even know about any side to Justin, but it's one where he tries to cancel and deplatform people he doesn't like. And he's even gone so far as to get them removed from speaking engagements. And I know this about him because he's done it to me. Justin is part of an online group who harasses, stalks, and coordinates attacks against people using Facebook, Reddit, Discord, and IRC, and I'm one of their primary targets. This group is run by an obsessed stalker who's been waging a smear campaign against me and others for years. And since Justin can't resist jumping on every piss and drama bandwagon that comes along, he joined this mob like many others before it. Except this time, Justin didn't just stand by as an idle observer, which would be bad enough. He became an active participant in this harassment campaign and personally went after my livelihood. Here's one of the posts that Justin made in this group where he was actively looking for my sources of income. And then he found one of my speaking engagements, or in his words, one of the workshops that keep the lights on at Casa de Maddox. He then pointed the harassment mob to this panel, posted a link to it in their Facebook group, tweeted directly at them multiple times, and then as if that wasn't scummy enough, he even posted the names of the panelists and organizers of the event, making it easier for the group to harass them. And after he pointed this mob to this event, they of course spammed the organizers with threats, smears, and harassment, and I was removed from the panel. Good job, dipshit. Maybe if Justin put as much work into his videos as he did trying to cancel people, they wouldn't be so shitty. And if you're wondering what kind of smears this group has been spreading about me, here's a small sample of the slander. Someone from this group created a fake Twitter account with a fake rape allegation against me. They even used pictures of an innocent girl they found on Instagram who wasn't even aware her pictures were being used like this. Then they created a false rape allegation using this fake profile and even claimed this fictional person sent me pictures of her pregnancy test after her rape and that she had to get an abortion. Remember that clip I played earlier where Justin said it's always the most sanctimonious people who are guilty, guilty of the, the thing, thing they claim to be so against? against. That clip was from a video where he talks about an activist group that outed people in the hardcore music scene. Justin criticized that group because at one point they went from just going after people who were abusive to actively seeking victims as a punitive measure against bands they didn't like by saying they needed more victims. As much as people have called all the other Me Too stories, witch hunts and shit like that, this is some next level shit when you put out a post saying need more victims. Well, this mob did the exact same thing using this fake account. They even went a step further from just looking for victims that don't exist to creating one with a fake rape allegation, which is a crime, and then they even tweeted it to people I'm associated with using the Me Too hashtag. This is among the most repugnant shit I've ever seen on the internet. Besides the slander itself, which is damaging in its own right, this kind of fake horse shit hurts actual rape victims, casting doubt into legitimate claims of rape and sexual assault. This is the kind of shit I've been dealing with from this group for years now, and when it's called out, they always lie, shift blame, and deny it was their group, but it's always the same group of people. 
How do I know? Because I've blocked most of them on Twitter, including Justin. And since most of them follow each other, and they're the only group of people I consistently block, I can tell at a glance when it's their group because all I have to do is look at who they're following, and it's the same people from the group that Justin's a part of, taking part in the same smear campaign like always. This is the story of how gullible dipshits like Justin can get caught up in online mobs fueled by hatred, lies, and gossip. Except this time, Justin got way too involved and crossed a line that he shouldn't have. So how did Justin get involved in all of this? Well, unfortunately, Justin has a rare medical condition called ITM HOFB, or inability to mind his own fucking business. Since Justin has this disease and is apparently unable to mind his own fucking business, when he came across the smear campaign, he couldn't resist joining the mob and personally going after me, even though I hadn't done anything to him. He not only got involved in the smear campaign, but at one point he ingratiated himself with one of the two main ringleaders of this harassment campaign and former moderators of this group, a guy by the name of Asterios Kokonos. In fact, at one point, Justin even became friends with his former moderator, a person who I eventually ended up having to take to court. So by now you're probably wondering, why did I have to take this person to court? I took him to court for fraud. This is a screenshot of an advertisement he purchased claiming to represent me and my company. He fraudulently published these false and misleading claims and targeted them directly at me and my fans. He boasted about his harassment campaign on a website called Kiwi Farms, which is a forum dedicated to stalking, doxing, and harassment. Asterios, a guy who calls himself the good boy of comedy, regularly posted on the forums where they doxed my home address and had some choice words to say about me. Why would the good boy of comedy be posting on a hate site like this? That's weird. He paid for this targeted harassment campaign after I blocked him on social media, and he did it specifically to hurt my book sales. And if you have any doubt, he said it himself. What I'm about to tell you is the story of what should have been a private disagreement that spiraled way out of control and led to some random guy I met years ago in a comedy club in LA becoming obsessed with me, which resulted in a lawsuit where I sued him, his partners, and his company to get him to leave me the fuck alone. So you might be wondering, who is this guy and how did we get involved? Well, he's a copywriter and an amateur comedian who considers himself a male feminist. He virtue signals about defending women's rights, working with female comedians, and how it's never okay to reduce people to their basest elements. <laughs> wow, what a hero. That is, of course, when he's not busy banning cunts on Facebook. And if the trend with outspoken male feminists is any indication, that should be a huge red flag. <sighs> I wonder if Justin has ever said anything about male feminists. And of course he has, because Justin never misses an opportunity to be a hypocrite. He has a huge problem with male feminists, unless of course, they're his friends. But back to Asterios for a minute. So you might be wondering, how did I cross paths with this guy? Well, the very short version is, I met him late one night after a comedy show in Los Angeles. He seemed like a friendly guy at first and wanted to promote some of his comedy, so I invited him on my podcast. But we had a falling out when I found out he talks behind people's backs. And that seems to be a pattern with him because he's had a falling out with three different co-hosts on three different podcasts. And there's even a fourth one he got fired from that's not even public knowledge, but maybe I'm the problem. So I called him out for being two-faced when I caught him talking behind his friend's back. Here's a small sample of the things he'd say about one of his supposed close friends behind his back in private, but then he'd go off the next day and pretend like they were good friends in public. When I catch someone being two-faced, I cut ties with them because they'll eventually do it to you. So I called him out on it, and that should have been the end of it. Except it wasn't. There's more to this conversation that I'll get to in a minute, but what happened next was insane. Asterio started harassing me, my friends, my sponsors, and even my guests on my podcast, all while playing the victim. He's extremely good at making himself out to be a victim and accusing others of doing exactly what he's accusing them of. For example, here's a DM conversation he had with one of my sponsors after harassing them on Twitter and implying that they committed fraud even after I took him to court for this type of harassment. He would obsessively write hundreds and hundreds of posts about me on Reddit and Twitter and Facebook and various other places online and at one point even sent me spam from his mailing list. In short, he became obsessed with me and at one point he even asked his girlfriend to watch my live streams to keep tabs on me. A full? You don't want to listen? All right, I love you, honey. Can you tell me what's happening with Maddox? Can you watch it and tell me? Uh, I'm watching a little bit of it. I don't know if I'm going to watch one He even followed me around online and left comments on YouTube videos if I so much as had an appearance in one. And part of the reason he seemed to be doing this was for money, because just about everywhere he went, he'd spam links to his Patreon account, which is definitely against their terms of service, 
But Patreon doesn't enforce their rules consistently, and that's a whole other story. At one point, he started combing through my website to find something problematic I'd written 20 years ago, and even contacted a comedy theater I performed at to try to get me canceled there. Except he got the theater wrong and messaged someplace in Brooklyn I'd never been to or even heard of. Maybe that's why he's friends with Justin, because apparently they're both bad at research. And as if trying to cancel me wasn't bad enough, at one point after months of smearing me publicly, he even encouraged his followers to review my podcast and even shared instructions on how to create an iTunes account without using a credit card, which is a way for people to write fake and duplicate negative reviews. And it's worth noting that all of this happened long before any lawsuits were filed. So you might be thinking, Gee, Maddox, what did you do to this guy? Did you go after him and encourage a mob to try to destroy his podcast and products with negative reviews? No, actually, I haven't done anything like that to him. So you might be thinking, well, maybe this has been a back and forth feud. Surely if he's been talking about me this much, I must have responded to at least some of his countless smears and comments about me, right? Nope. In fact, until this video, I haven't even mentioned this guy in public in over five years. And I mean that literally. While he ran his mouth constantly on Twitter, the number of tweets I made about him are zero. The number of Facebook posts I made about him, zero. The number of times I mention him on my podcast, zero. I haven't attacked him or even mentioned him in public anywhere on any platform, nor have I asked or encouraged any of my fans to attack him in public or private in any capacity, not once, ever, period. So if I wasn't doing anything to this guy, why was he on the attack? Well, you saw one possible explanation earlier, money. He not only spammed his Patreon link in conjunction with the smear campaign, his friends and followers even went to my personal website and spammed links to his Patreon constantly on his behalf. But there was only one problem. If I wasn't responding or doing anything to him, how could he justify his continued attacks? Well, he came up with the perfect explanation. He accused me of conducting a shadow war and engaging in a whisper campaign where I allegedly went around Los Angeles whispering things about him and his friends, which is bizarre because I promise you, there is nothing I could whisper about this guy that's worse than the things I've put in this video, which are just things he's actually done. Accusing someone of a shadow war is the perfect allegation to make when you don't have any evidence to back up your claims. If anyone asked for proof, he could simply say, oh, it was all part of the shadow war. So by definition, there was no proof. This is some of the most delusional, psychotic bullshit I've ever seen. He accused me of all sorts of things where I literally had no fucking idea what he was even talking about. And of course, all without any evidence. He even accused me of creating alternate Twitter accounts and downvoting his YouTube videos like I don't have anything better to do than to downvote videos on some random guy's YouTube channel who I met in a comedy club over half a fucking decade ago. Again, all of these allegations without a single shred of evidence. But unfortunately, if you repeat a false claim enough, no matter how ridiculous that claim is, eventually someone gullible enough will not only believe it, but they'll go so far as to attack the person on your behalf. And that's exactly what happened. So you might be wondering, what kind of gullible dipshit would not only believe a false claim about another person without evidence, but then make it their business and attack them for it? Enter Justin Wang. Justin typifies this idiotic mob mentality that has overtaken the entire internet because Justin Wang is a fucking idiot. I am a fucking idiot. Really, he's stupid. Like really, I'm, I'm stupid. Some of you may realize this already, but some of you may just be learning this fact. I'm sure some of you guys realize this already, but uh, I'm just fucking learning this fact. As you saw earlier in this video, Justin Wang loves to go down rabbit holes of pissant drama he finds on the internet. Except this time, he went way too far. I almost feel bad for Justin because he obviously got manipulated by bad actors with malicious and financial motives who took advantage of some very gullible people. But Justin wasn't the only person duped. At one point, Asterios asked one of his stalker buddies, a former fan of mine named Isaias Lozano, to share my private conversations with him. Asterios then took these doctored up conversations and used them to buy those fraudulent ads he placed on Reddit. At one point, I had to look into getting a restraining order against this former fan of mine because even after I blocked him six times on various social media networks, he kept contacting me. And of course, he's also a male feminist. And if his name sounds familiar, that's because you might have noticed it earlier because surprise, surprise, it's one of the accounts followed by the fake rape allegation on Twitter. You may be noticing a pattern here. But before we go on, remember the text conversation I mentioned earlier? The one where he was talking behind the back of one of his business partners and supposed friends? During the course of that conversation, while we were having our falling out, 
he said something very strange to me. While we were having a disagreement, out of the blue, he said that he hoped that my new book would do very well when it came out. That's a very weird thing to say to somebody during an argument, so I ignored him. But then he said it a second time, saying, really, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, have a very successful book launch. I can't wait. It sounded like a threat. That's like saying, I hope your kids sleep well tonight during a heated argument. That's a threat. So I told him, don't go after me because I can go after your pocketbook too. Then he did something very strange. He said, go nuts. And then he gave me the contact information for a company I'd never heard of before, a company called Weber Shanwick. And in case you're wondering if that's just an off the cuff remark, it wasn't. He not only encouraged me to contact them, but he actually gave me their contact information. Yes, really. I was tempted to call, but I didn't. Even though this guy was threatening my livelihood, I still showed restraint and didn't bother contacting them. Why would I? What would I have to gain by calling this guy's work? It's not like he was doing this stuff on company time with the express knowledge of his supervisors. Was he? Well, it turns out he was. After Hysterios' escalation of these attacks week after week, month after month, year after year, through a stroke of luck, I got an inside tip from someone who worked at his company with first-hand knowledge of their internal operations. I learned that their IT department keeps logs of all the websites visited on company time, which isn't unusual for a company of that size to do. Oops. This is one part of the video where I won't disclose my source to protect the parties involved, but if you have any doubt, there were multiple eyewitnesses who watched him do this from work, including his own followers, because the genius live streamed it from work. So when it became clear that he wasn't going to stop going after my livelihood and harassing me, my friends, my acquaintances, and doing it on company time no less, as a last resort, I decided to contact his work out of desperation to get him to stop. Keep in mind, this was after months of his attacks, so I showed a lot of restraint by not contacting them immediately. I sent an email and tried to remain anonymous to his company in an effort to avoid further retaliation, in part because the girl I was dating at the time was receiving countless rape and death threats from this mob. And I know he did this with the explicit knowledge that this group that he was part of makes these types of threats. How do I know? Because they've even done it to him and his ex-wife. Wow, what a feminist. Oh, yeah. I thought a company like Weber Shanwick would step in and do the right thing because they like to stress how forward thinking and progressive they are, releasing statement after statement about how they're leaders in diversity and inclusion. They even released an article proudly boasting about how many people of color they've promoted. Very progressive of them to tally up the colored people in their office for a bullet point and a marketing sheet for their company. So surely this progressive company would put a stop to this harassment, right? Nope. In fact, they told him about my email, allowed him to continue the harassment campaign, and things got worse. One of Weber Shanwick's clients was the UN Women's Group, and Asterios worked for their campaign. Nice of him to take time away from banning cunts, but don't worry, those cunts weren't even that hot. But at this point, I have to admit I made a mistake. Had I known then what I know now, would I have contacted his employer? Absolutely not. I would have contacted them much sooner because I had no idea these maniacs would still be going at it over half a decade later. That's how this ultimately became a lawsuit because this random guy I met at a comedy scene in Los Angeles became obsessed, caused damages, and doesn't know how to fuck off. In my 23 years of doing this, I've never had a problem with anyone. I think lawsuits should only be used as a last resort. In fact, I told him as much. What's not publicly known is that at some point during the suit, I reached out to him directly for the first time in years and offered to unilaterally drop the lawsuit for the low, low cost of leave me the fuck alone. It was all I ever wanted, and I didn't even ask for legal fees or damages. Again, all he had to do was fuck off, and that would have been the end of it. I was polite and cordial in my communication. I said, take your life back, and ended the text by saying, let's end this tonight. With only 20 minutes before the midnight deadline, he finally replied and said, please communicate through your lawyer and mine. Since he left me less than 18 minutes to respond, I took the cordial tone as a sign of reconciliation and goodwill, so I decided to end things and hope that he would finally stop and leave me the fuck alone. So I responded and said that I would drop everything and hoped that cooler heads would prevail. But he didn't acknowledge it in public and carried on the next day pretending like this conversation didn't occur, milking it for all it was worth. Then he tried to file a counterclaim that got thrown out and finally 
That's where you think things would have ended. Except of course it didn't. Then Asterio started to carpet bomb the internet with his false victim narrative while gaslighting me and telling everyone that I sued him because he called me the word cuck. The word cuck is an insult used to emasculate men, similar to calling someone a beta, soy boy, or a Yes, even though he committed fraud, harassed my friends, sponsors, and spammed me relentlessly for years, somehow he was the victim because he got sued. Newsflash, 100% of people who get sued don't like it. I couldn't give less of a shit if he called me a cuck or a I've been called way worse in the comment section of my own videos daily. His narrative doesn't even make sense. People have been calling me names much worse for years and I haven't sued anyone. You can call me whatever names you want. That's protected speech. What's not protected is fraud, threats, stalking, and harassment. When Asterios bought those ads on Reddit, he did it using my name and my business, targeting my fans specifically to hurt my book sales with misleading statements. So no, I don't care about being called playground names. What I care about are damages. Don't like it? Don't stalk, harass, and commit fraud and you won't get sued. Despite these facts, Asterios continued to spread this bullshit narrative everywhere he could. He tried to get media attention on it, but since most people have never heard of this guy, the only people who would cover the story were his friends in the media. The first person was a guy named Brock Wilbur, an outspoken male mm. feminist. And of course, like many other outspoken male feminists, he was me too Here's an article about him titled, I was played by a male feminist, where he allegedly dated someone without disclosing he had a live-in girlfriend while virtue signaling about Gamergate and women's rights. And he's also been accused of being a serial abuser. So this male feminist, Brock Wilbur, covered his serious story for a website called Paste Magazine, where he conveniently forgot to mention little details like the fact that he and Asterios are friends, and that Asterios is a contributor to the very magazine interviewing him. Oops, just a slip of the mind not to mention this major conflict of interest and not a deliberate attempt to whitewash his friend's narrative, right? Brock didn't bother reaching out to me for comment and he sure as shit didn't disclose his relationship to Asterios. But that wasn't the end of Asterios' carpet bombing campaign because he had another friend in the media, a writer from Vice named Mike Pearl. Mike is his longtime friend and former roommate. He's written such articles for Vice like this one about the legalities of pseudo kitty porn. The only problem was, Mike wouldn't have been able to write about me because I've actually met Mike before, several times. In fact, we've all hung out together, so if he tried to write an article about me, I would have been suspicious. So instead, I got contacted by another writer from Vice, a guy by the name of Justin Caffier. And surprise, surprise, he's another male feminist. He rails about toxic masculinity, but apparently he makes exceptions for his buddies in Facebook groups that stalk, dox, and harass people. When he contacted me, I was immediately suspicious. So I asked him if he was Asterios' former roommate because I couldn't remember Mike's name. Justin knew who I was talking about and immediately said that was Mike and even admitted that he'd met Asterios before. But he didn't disclose how close they were. This made me even more suspicious. So I looked up Justin and it turns out that he not only knows who Mike Pearl is, but they're longtime friends and even do a podcast together. Oops. When I pressed Caffier about this, he downplayed his relationship to Asterios and said that they weren't friends. He even went a step further in public saying that they'd only spoken once prior to this story. Well, that's funny because I found this Twitter thread where they communicated as far back as 2015 and another one from 2014 where all three of them, Justin, Mike, and Asterios were on the same thread together. That's weird, almost like all three of them were friends. Since he wasn't forthright, I decided to investigate a little bit further. Turns out that they're much closer than he let on. Caffier has not only met Asterios, but he follows him on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. At the time of this recording, Caffier only followed about six public figures on Facebook, including Barack Obama and Steve G. So it's pretty telling that he made Asterios one of the few people he follows on every platform. I don't even follow some of my closest friends on all three platforms. And in case you think that he did it just for research, we can rule that out because he doesn't follow me anywhere. Then I dug a little bit deeper and surprise, surprise, guess who they invited as a guest on Justin and Mike's podcast? None other than Asterios Kokonos. I'm sure it was a total benign lapse in memory and not a deliberate attempt to hide his relationship because as a journalist advice, it might be looked down upon to publish puff pieces about your friends without disclosing your relationship. Although it's Vice, so I'm not sure if they have any journalistic standards to begin with. 
And if you have any doubt as to how close they were, they even promoted Asterios' narrative on the podcast, plugged his fundraiser for him to try to counter Subi, and Asterios signed off the episode, and I can't make this up, by saying, I'll talk to you guys later, I love you both, to which they responded, love you, bye. Thank you. All right, I'll talk to you guys later, I love you both. Totally normal way to end an interview with a journalist. So contrary to Justin's claim, that's four instances that they've communicated before this article, and that's just what's been documented publicly. So if I did my math correctly, that makes Justin Caffier a liar. So the guy wanting to write an article about me from Vice is friends with the guy he's writing about and his roommate. I love you both. You'd think that that would be an important piece of information to disclose. I wonder why he didn't mention that. They also plugged Asterios' podcast, except he forgot to mention his podcast on Cunt Media. Hmm, why does that sound so familiar? Oh, that's right, it was one of the accounts followed by the person who made the fake rape allegation. And we've come full circle. And in case you're wondering how deep this nepotistic rabbit hole goes, I checked the pages Justin was following on Facebook and Paste Magazine was one of them. The very same website that Asterios is a contributor for and the one where Brock Wilbur published his hit piece about me. So the jig was up. I asked Caffier if he'd disclose this conflict of interest in the article. He said he'd run it by his editors, but he didn't get back to me with their response. So, since Caffier didn't follow up with what his editor said, I stopped responding. When the article came out, Caffier accused me of ghosting him, which is misleading. What actually happened is we had several scheduling conflicts, and after badgering me for weeks, I tried to accommodate him even while I was traveling out of the country. When we finally agreed on a day, Justin didn't follow through, and he didn't contact me again for nearly a month. Since he was unprofessional and not forthright, I stopped responding. But Justin simply said that I turned down the interview, which implies that I didn't give him a statement, except I did. Literally, my first response to him stated that almost everything said about me has been false or misleading. When the article came out, Caffier, of course, didn't publish the statement and neglected to disclose his relationship to Asterios. This isn't even the first time Caffier has written a puff piece for one of his friends. Back in 2018, he wrote this article where he helped promote his friend's TV show without disclosing their relationship. I've written a full article about Justin's nepotism and his failure to disclose his conflicts of interest at Vice Magazine for those of you who are interested. As for why I'm finally talking about this, it's because I'm still dealing with the fallout from Mysterios' smear campaign. He even published his false narrative on his friend Rich Kianka's website, better known as Low Tax. Low Tax's greatest hits include Something Awful and Women. And of course, Asterios even defended low tax in his hit piece against me. And the stuff you've seen in this video barely scratches the surface, like when he started posting what he claimed to be my girlfriend's phone number online, which caused her distress because she'd have to drop everything she was doing and check social media every time this dipshit threatened to dox her. Except the fucking idiot added the real area code of the city we live in, so his hate mob started calling and harassing some random guy in Los Angeles. Good job, dumbass. If Asterios hadn't carpet bombed the internet with so much bullshit, I probably wouldn't have had to make this video. And if he didn't threaten me, encourage people to review bomb my podcast, harass my sponsors, and publish a fraudulent ad to hurt my book sales, I wouldn't have had to take him to court. I would honestly love to never have to mention this idiot ever again. Had Justin not involved himself and minded his own fucking business instead of attacking me completely unprovoked, I wouldn't have had to make this video about him either. What I've learned through all of this is that there's almost no downside to slander. If you smear somebody on a platform like YouTube, you gain money, clicks, and notoriety. And when the person you're slandering responds to set the record straight and prove you wrong, as they usually do, the person making the smears can either double down and get more clicks on the drama, or they can apologize. Unless the person you're slandering has the time, energy, and resources to litigate, scumbags like Justin will always profit off of slander and drama. And even if Justin doesn't monetize his apology, the damage is already done. He successfully removed me from a panel and silenced me from speaking engagements. How did we get to this point in this country where instead of debating the people that we disagree with, we just want to silence them outright? Yeah, good question, Justin. I wonder how we got here. People like Justin represent the very worst elements of cancel culture. He's exactly like the woke SJW PC culture he claims to hate, except worse, because at least they're not pretending to be champions of free speech. If anyone deserves to be the target of cancel culture, it's truly him and all the shady, clout-chasing drama losers like him. Well, you like drama so much, congratulations, dipshit. Now you have some of your own. The only reason I ever took any of these people to court is because they don't know how to fuck off and leave people alone. Don't like it? Don't fuck with people's livelihoods and they won't fuck with yours. 
Justin, Asterios, Vice, and the phony progressives of Weber Shanwick can all go fuck themselves. So in conclusion, what have we learned? Unfortunately, that nothing ever gets accomplished unless you make a big public stink about it. From having to bitch about customer service on social media to get remonetized on YouTube and to getting people to leave you the fuck alone, nothing ever gets done unless you go public. So part of the reason I'm making this video now is to let people know about some of the bullshit I've been dealing with for years now. So part of the fallout from all of this is that Justin Wang has now been exposed as an unfunny plagiarist, a joke thief, and a hack. But of all his offenses, perhaps the most egregious one, and the one that's most unforgivable, is that he's part of a new metal band. Don't forget to send me your Tales from the Internet videos. There's a lot more to this story, and maybe I'll tell it someday if there's any interest. Comment below and let me know. That's it for now. Until next time, I'm Maddox. I'm someone who has been falsely accused of assault by a woman. You can't just believe everyone who says something happened.